In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1907 annual report of Sears, Roebuck, and Company. This was the earliest annual report after they went public in 1906. Unfortunately, it is only three pages long. I have a cover page, an income statement, and a balance sheet. The annual report remains this short for decades, as the 1930 annual report is still just three pages. Luckily, though, I found some interesting books that really helped me understand the time period better. The story of Sears is fascinating on multiple levels. Sears used to be the dominant company at one point in time. History shows us many examples of companies that, although they once looked unstoppable, they end up falling eventually. This is especially the case in retail. On top of this, I wanted to learn more about the history of the mail order business, its economics, and if there were any similarities to e-commerce today. Sears was a spawner as well, that is, an entrepreneurial company that created new businesses internally from scratch. How did it do this? What did the company look like through these transitions? The mail order business has a long history in the U.S., Here's a quote that really opened my eyes to this fact. It's from the book, The Grand Emporiums, by Robert Hendrickson. Quote, It is obvious that mail order is as American as cherry pie or chewing gum, a business that is largely indigenous to this country and has affected every aspect of American life, from love and birth to loneliness and dying. Our earliest ancestors, with no manufacturers of their own in a virgin land, first used mail orders to obtain supplies from the mother country. George Washington ordered goods from England and France, as did Thomas Jefferson and, most likely, all the rest of the founding fathers. Benjamin Franklin, as a matter of fact, had been called the father of the mail order catalog because he issued a list in 1744 of 600 books he would like to sell by mail, end quote. The first large mail order business ended up being Montgomery Ward, founded in 1872. Life was a little bit different back in the 1800s. Around 70% of Americans lived in rural parts of the country, and oftentimes one country store served a given area. We are still decades away from Henry Ford helping bring the automobile into the mainstream, so traveling into town to go shopping was quite the trip. This meant that the local country store had pricing power over customers as they had limited competition. With that being said, the country store was in a difficult bargaining position with its suppliers. In this case, suppliers could be wholesalers who operate as the middlemen between manufacturers and the retail outlets. There weren't too many retail chains serving rural areas back in this time period. There weren't too many retail chains in general. So the country store was a mom-and-pop shop. Without scale, suppliers could push around the folks running the country store. With the ability of both the suppliers and the country store owner to charge high prices, it was unlikely that the rural consumers were getting much of a bargain in most cases. Rural consumers were unhappy with the end result. The mail order business offered a chance for this scene to change. A large mail order company could order products straight from the manufacturer and sell to consumers all across America. This would cut out the profit margin that the middleman wholesaler earned and would improve bargaining power on price with suppliers due to scale. The mail order business model could bring about efficiencies and there would be strong consumer demand for a service like this, especially in rural America. Consumers were experimenting with other ideas as well. The Grange was formed as a buying cooperative so that rural consumers could team up and benefit from scale through larger orders. Montgomery Ward, the first large mail order company, ended up securing the Grange as a customer, which really helped the company's growth early on. In the late 1800s, there were some other tailwinds that really allowed for the mail order business to take off. Rural free delivery was introduced in 1896, which meant that 
mail would be delivered straight to homes, even in rural areas. Previously, residents had to travel to the post office to get their mail. In many towns, the country store also served as a post office. With rural free delivery, a mail order catalog can now be delivered straight to the consumer's home. Interestingly, this forced the U.S. to work on building or improving roads, playing at least a small part in making consumer adoption of the automobile a little easier some years later. Additionally, Parcel Post began in 1913, which meant that things larger than a letter, like packages, could now be shipped to the home as well. These were all some nice tailwinds that the mail order companies benefited from. That was some background on the founding of the mail order industry. Now I'm going to get into Sears Roebuck and Company. As I mentioned earlier, Montgomery Ward was the first large mail order company and was founded in 1872. Richard Sears founded the R.W. Sears Watch Company in 1886. The book Grand Emporiums gives a little detail on the founding of this business. Quote, his father died a bitter man when Richard was only 14, blaming his failures on politicians, and the boy became the family breadwinner, learning telegraphy and eventually becoming the freight agent of the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad Station in North Redwood, Minnesota. His $6 a week paycheck inspired him to find other ways to make extra money, and so he sold lumber and coal to local residents in his spare time. A few years later, a shipment of 500 unordered gold-filled watches refused by a Redwood Falls jeweler was returned to the railroad office and Sears bought them from the Chicago maker for resale. When the watches sold out quickly to neighbors and train crews, he ordered more, selling these to other stations up and down the line at a profit of about $2 a piece. Since he was bonded as a station agent, and didn't have to pay for the watches on delivery, the enterprising young man took no risk at all, end quote. There's a little bit to unpack here. The passage said that a shipment of 500 unordered watches were refused by a jeweler. This was common back in this era. A supplier trying to sell watches to a retailer would often just send the product even if it was never ordered in hopes that the retailer would just accept the delivery. In this case, the jeweler denied the shipment, and the watches went back to the railroad office that they were shipped from. Sears bought these watches, but didn't have to put up any money. He was taking no risk. He was bonded as a train station agent, so these suppliers must have trusted him. On Richard Sears' hypothetical balance sheet, he basically funded this transaction with payables from the supplier. His distribution strategy wasn't to find a retailer who wanted them, but to find another train station agent who was willing to buy them for resale. The profits were small, but there was no risk and no capital investment needed by Sears. When there are no capital requirements and little risk, competition will emerge. There were low barriers to entry for a small mail order startup. Early on, many small mail order firms would wait until orders came in before tracking down and acquiring inventory. This means that some early firms didn't ever have any inventory at all. Customers paid cash, so there weren't any receivables either. This was a nice situation in terms of working capital. Shipping was starting to get easier as well, with the post office, railroads, and private freight haulers all contributing to deliveries. Pretty quickly, Sears moved from Minneapolis to Chicago to take advantage of better shipping facilities, and the business began assembling its own watches. This is where Alva Roebuck entered the picture, as he had some experience as a watchmaker. Surprisingly, Richard Sears sold his business in 1890. This departure was short-lived, though, as he joined forces again with Roebuck just months later. By 1893, the business was renamed Sears, Roebuck & Company. Sears was in the mail order business from the beginning. The firm started out by selling through newspaper ads, 
but quickly moved to writing its own catalog. This was one area of Richard Sears' expertise. He was a scrappy entrepreneur. Sears ended up being a natural salesman, both in terms of writing advertising, as well as in merchandising. There's always a great merchandiser behind every great retailing operation. That idea comes to mind when reading Sam Walton's biography on his founding of Walmart. That book hammered home for me that merchandising is the name of the game. When reading about Richard Sears, I was reminded of the early days of John Patterson from the National Cash Register Company. There seems to be a weird trait of entrepreneurs where they can be indecisive and restless before they find their life's work, but then able to focus and commit once they find it. That restlessness gets channeled into their organization. For example, Richard Sears convinced Roebuck to join his mail order business, and six weeks later, Sears told him, We will not stay here much more than a year. I'll sell out. We'll go to some town in Iowa and start a big retail store, and you will be my best and first man. The company never sold through stores during Richard Sears' lifetime. Here he is with his business gaining traction, yet he's already thinking about leaving and starting the next thing. A little over a year after starting his company, Sears sold it for $72,000 and decided to invest in farm mortgages in Iowa. He would quickly change his mind again and start a new mail order business and eventually join back up with Roebuck. After all this back and forth, he would remain focused on Sears, Roebuck, and company, and it would really become his life's work. I did a podcast in the past about John Patterson and the National Cash Register Company. Once he came into contact with a cash register for the first time, he was quick to recognize its importance. He quickly invested in the company that made cash registers. Yet, once the company reported that it lost money the next year, Patterson sold his investment to anyone he could find. He quickly got out and decided he wanted to go into farming out west. Bear with me here as I'm going to read a quote from the excellent biography called John H. Patterson, Pioneer in Industrial Welfare. Quote, Late in October, they stopped at Colorado Springs to decide which of the three ranches they would buy. One evening, they fell into conversation with a merchant from the east who informed them that he was on a long vacation. John Patterson, always anxious to learn, wanted to know how any merchant could afford to take the chance of leaving his business for that length of time. The merchant told Mr. Patterson that he had a good manager and also he owned machines made in Dayton, which counted the cash receipts. Each day, there was mailed to him a statement with the punched paper roll from the cash register. This, he said, gave him a perfect check on his business and he had no reason to worry. The following morning, the merchant showed a report to Mr. Patterson. That night, John Patterson said to his brother, Frank, this man's experience with the cash register is just the same as ours. What was good for the little store in Colton is good for every store in the world. It is only necessary to convince merchants of the good that the machines will do and they will be used in every store on earth. The cash register business can be made one of the largest industries in America. The next day, they left for Dayton with the intention of buying a controlling interest in the National Manufacturing Company, end quote. So Patterson invested in the cash register, then he wants out, and now he's traveling back to Dayton to get back into the business. I find it interesting that Patterson is about to second-guess himself one more time. He went back to Dayton and struck an agreement with the owner to buy a controlling interest in the National Manufacturing Company for $6,500. By the next day, Patterson decided that he had made a mistake and tried to back out of the agreement. He offered $100 and then offered $500 to the former owner if he would cancel the purchase agreement and take back control of the National Manufacturing Company. The former owner declined. Apparently, neither of these men wanted to own the cash register company, at least on this particular day. So now John Patterson was stuck with the cash register business 
and he would go on to make it his life's work. I got a little bit off tangent here, but I just find it funny how, on one hand, we have two men who focused on one company and committed to it for so much of their life. Yet, on the other hand, early on they seemed indecisive and restless. Both of these firms were excellent at adapting and constantly improving, and I just wonder if that restlessness from their founders got channeled into their organization. Anyways, eventually things did not work out between Richard Sears and Alva Roebuck. Sears was a restless entrepreneur who wanted constant growth. At some points, this would mean stretching the company pretty far in terms of leverage and taking on risk. Roebuck wanted a more peaceful life. In 1895, Roebuck sold his half of the company to Aaron Nussbaum and Julius Rosenwald for $75,000. Rosenwald would go on to be one of the most influential leaders of the company as he balanced out Richard Sears. Rosenwald was the internal organizer and manager. He was the operations guy, while Sears was a salesman. The inflation calculator I typically use only goes back to 1913, so this isn't exact, but $75,000 in 1913 would be equivalent to roughly $2.4 million today. This was a nice sum of money for Roebuck, but it turned out to be a poor time to sell as Sears took off over the next few years. In 1901, Aaron Nussbaum decided to sell his stake in the company, which had cost him $37,500 in 1895. Sears and Rosenwald paid $1.25 million to buy out Nussbaum which was an incredible increase in valuation over just six years. It only took two years for Sears and Rosenwald to pay off the $1.25 million owed to Nussbaum. Obviously, Sears, Roebuck & Company must have been growing fast. Just a year prior, in 1900, Sears had revenues of $11 million. This made it the largest mail-order firm in the nation, surpassing Montgomery Ward. In 1903, The company was profitable enough that Sears and Rosenwald were able to pay out a special dividend of almost $2.5 million. I assume this is what freed up cash to pay off the amount owed to Nussbaum. This is incredible. Sears, Roebuck, and company must have been producing plenty of cash flow to go along with its growth. To recap, the company had a valuation of $150,000 in 1895. In 1901, the valuation was approaching $5 million. This is not normal. Typically, growing companies absorb cash as investment is needed to grow. It is unusual to have both extremely high growth along with plenty of cash lying around. Well, eventually Sears, Roebuck, and company was in need of a cash infusion. The owners paid out a large dividend at a time when the firm was buying up warehouse and office properties for expansion. In 1906, Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers helped the company sell around $9 million of Sears' preferred stock. This led Sears, Roebuck, and company to being a publicly traded company. It is also the reason why I have an annual report for the company starting in 1907, which I'm thankful for. Now, after all that introduction, I'm going to finally get to my three-page annual report. Despite the brevity, this annual report helps fill in some gaps in the story, at least in my mind. Growth and funding are two topics worth discussing here. In terms of growth, the 1907 annual report notes that revenue amounted to over $53 million. This is pretty incredible. Sales were at $11 million in 1900 when it became the largest mail order company. Revenue increased by almost five times during this seven-year period. From a standing start of about zero in 1886, when the R.W. Sears Watch Company was formed, to $53 million of sales by 1907. This was quite the few decades for Sears, Roebuck & Company. I naively thought that things moved a little slower back in the late 1800s, but Sears has proved otherwise. The company ended up earning $3.2 million in 1907, 
which was a profit margin of 6%. The balance sheet is interesting in this annual report in terms of how Sears was able to fund its growth. There was almost no investment in working capital, which must have been important in its early years. At the end of 1907, Sears had $42.3 million of equity capital. It had $39.2 million of property, plant, and equipment. The rest of the line items came close to balancing out. This means that all the capital invested in the business was related to offices, warehouses, storage facilities, and things of that nature. Many retailers have capital tied up in inventory or receivables, but that was not the case at Sears. Payables exceeded inventory at the company, which means that suppliers were financing the inventory at this point in time. Receivables, disclosed as due from customers, were negligible at around $200,000. Customers generally paid cash when orders were placed. I find this balance sheet interesting because I believe it explains how Sears was able to grow so fast while still having the ability to pay out cash dividends. In the very early days, Sears didn't invest in major real estate projects or have much shipping or warehouse operations. I assume Sears could rent out modest facilities when it was a new business. This means that property, plant, and equipment probably wasn't an important investment for the company until it started to really scale up. Eventually, this type of investment became a necessity. Without this PP&E, capital requirements were very low. As I mentioned, net working capital could be near zero. When capital requirements are low, cash profits can be paid out to owners or used to buy out other shareholders, and this is what happened in the early 1900s at Sears. Basically, this was a bootstrap business all the way up until its IPO in 1906. There's so much more to this story that I find interesting. Sears hit a rough patch during the difficult economic environment around 1920. The firm entered the brick-and-mortar retail business in a major way, created all-state insurance, became a real estate developer, started owning certain suppliers and manufacturers, and got into the financing business and extended credit cards to customers. At one point, Sears was on top of the world with sales around 1% of U.S. GDP. Eventually, it went bankrupt after all this triumph. I'm going to save all this for some future episodes, though. I'll make one more point to put the success in Sears into context. The stock price of Sears, Roebuck & Company rose by 2,000 times in value from 1908 to its peak in 1972. The firm had an $18 billion valuation at the end of this period. If you assume the reinvestment of dividends, an investment in Sears would have compounded at a rate of 16% per year over more than 60 years. Sears was a dominant retailer in 1972, and that was 86 years after its founding. Not many businesses have that kind of longevity, and fewer have that kind of long-term compound rate of return. This ridiculous result is worth studying in detail. That is where I'll leave off for this annual report. In the next episode, I plan to carry on with my study of Sears, Roebuck, and Company as they grew and adapted over time. In the meantime, I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks for listening.